Rockaway Blue is the story of two families, the Irish-American Murphys from Rockaway Beach and the Egyptian-American Ibrahims from Bay Ridge in Brooklyn. Now, the Murphy family consists of Jimmy, a detective sergeant in the New York Police Department, and his wife, Maggie, an English high school teacher. There are two sons, Brian, an overachiever who becomes one of the youngest lieutenants in the New York Police Department, and his younger brother, Kevin, who has always been uh, living a little bit in Brian's shadow, and he's a member of the NYFT. Lieutenant Brian Murphy gets killed uh, on 9-11. And about a year later, his father Jimmy discovers that Brian was actually in the North Tower 30 minutes before the plane struck. He sets out to find out why Brian was there. And his journey takes him back to his old friend, Yosef Ibrahim, and to Yosef's beautiful young daughter, Fatima. Rockaway Blue begins early one May morning on the Rockaway Beach boardwalk. That first draft of salt sea air always cleared his head. Sometimes he even trekked down to the water's edge and played chicken with the surf and spray, despite Maggie's insistence that the salt corroded his black leather shoes and that he was mad as a hatter not to wear sneakers like everyone else. Jimmy had never cared for sneakers, felt that took the dignity away from a man, and of late, there was little else holding him together. More often than not, he just leaned over the railing on the Rockaway boardwalk and gazed out at the breakers. He didn't need to be that close to the ocean anymore. It was bone deep inside him. Even halfway around the world, when he was crawling on his gut up near the DMZ, sucking in the tang of jungle decay and the reek of woolly peat, he could sink his face in memories of Rockaway surf and know that whatever happened to anyone else, Jimmy Murphy was going to make it home alive from Vietnam. And in the bad old days of the 70s, when still a rocky cop, he often stood on the self-same boardwalk spot and watched the sun rise up out of the Atlantic. And in those jittery dawns, he could feel the first gentle rays burn away all the residual bullshit of the insomniac city. Jimmy never tired of his boardwalk ritual. It always grounded him for he had the ocean's vastness, hardly more than a stone's throw from his kitchen. That set him and the peninsula apart. But the peninsula was narrow in more ways than one. And from time to time, Jimmy chafed against the resultant insularity. But it was the only home he had ever known. And no matter where he dallied, he always returned to his concrete strip of heaven that perched warily by the side of the unpredictable Atlantic. Next parish, Jimmy? He hadn't heard Artie creep up behind him, but he did catch the note of triumph. The old man had pulled a number on Detective Sergeant James Murphy, 30-year veteran of the NYPD. Yeah, Artie, just beyond the horizon, Jimmy acknowledged a small victory. How's Maggie, Jimmy? 
She's fine, Artie. Just fine, babe. For the first year or two, that question had set him on edge, even coming from a harmless old beach bum. But on this May Day, 2004, almost three years later, well, things weren't nearly as bad. The truth be told, Maggie had caused a sensation, bawling her head off on the boardwalk and everyone else was taking their lumps and sucking it up after the big bang. Mrs. Maggie Murphy, of all people. The English teacher at Stella Maris, always a together one, well-dressed, just the right hint of makeup. Who would have expected it? The whole beach felt bad for the Murphys. They were good people, always there for everyone else. So his wife was cut some slack. And yet, the question, how's Maggie? Still set Jimmy on edge and flung him right back to that brutal September morning almost three years before. The dust had been stultifying, but Jimmy had found a working phone some blocks from the North Tower and called Maggie to say Kevin was safe. Someone had seen him up around Canal Street evacuating residents with his fire crew. I know, he called and told me he was okay, but where's Brian, where's Brian? Maggie had kept repeating as the line crackled, cutting in and out. Call Rose, she'll know. He didn't come home last night. Rose has no idea where he is. Though Jimmy's anger spiked at another one of his son's unexplained absences. He rattled off some crap about Brian going down to D.C. on Giuliani business before hanging up. But it was the same story, no matter where he inquired. Cops and fire, missing big time. Gotta wait till the dust settles. Back near the North Plaza, he ran into Sergeant Noah Jensen from Midtown North, who said he was pretty sure Brian was off duty. But Jimmy knew he had to be nearby. Brian was always at the center of things. Why would this be any different? But then the ground began to shake, and both Jimmy and Jensen ran when they heard the same monstrous groan the South Tower had given. Jensen sprinted ahead, but when he turned to look back, Jimmy could see his eyes almost bulge from their sockets. Jimmy spun round, just as the huge antenna sunk into the collapsing roof 110 stories up. Then the North Tower trembled before it tumbled methodically down, sending a wind howling across the plaza and through the canyons of lower Manhattan. Jimmy surrendered to it and ran through the clouds of dust, but the gathering gray hurricane sent him staggering over a sidewalk curb. He picked himself up and stumbled on again, his arms outstretched in the viscous semi-darkness suddenly hit a window frame. He slid to a halt, his forehead grazing against glass. He had no idea where he was. But he had gained some kind of shelter, for the force of the wind lessened. He covered his nose and mouth and held on for dear life. The overwhelming din of spars clattering, steel bending and concrete collapsing rose in a crescendo, then faded very slowly until a dense, eerie silence blanketed everything like the morning after a blizzard. Jimmy stayed in the doorway, scared out of his wits to move or even turn round. Finally, when the smoke and choking filth had thinned somewhat, he warily inched out into a big, dusty, plowed up graveyard, where once Two gleaming towers preened, boasting of their strength and permanence. Now only a couple of gaping walls stood, the glass from the cathedral-like windows pulverized and floating about 
in the poisonous powdery grime. Men were already clawing at twisted steel beams, slabs of rock and mountains of rubble and everywhere a smell like kerosene from the thousands of gallons of jet fuel. Clouds of smoke and dust were ebbing and flowing amidst a steady confetti-like hail of paper, all illuminated by ghostly fires. And it was hard to see for minutes on end, but occasionally the wind would shift and it would clear for a few seconds. Then, with the sun burning through the haze, he saw a Port Authority sergeant that Brian used to hang with back at Regis when they were kids. The sergeant said he'd seen Brian with Richie Sullivan inside the North Tower, and they both had plenty of time to get out. What does that prove? Jimmy said. And where's Sullivan? Where do you think? The sergeant lifted an imaginary drink to his mouth. But Jimmy knew exactly where Sullivan would be, and he found his old partner in Kelly's of Cedar Street. The bartender was locking up, dumping envelopes stuffed with cash in a backpack. Sullivan was already half gone from the shock and a pint glass of whiskey. Jimmy shook the large, disheveled frame of his old partner as the white dust rose in plumes around them. It took a while, but through all the crying and slobbering, he made out that Brian had led seven people out of the North Tower, raced back in for more, and then the whole show came tumbling down on top of him. And Jimmy was screaming that the son of a bitch was lying. But Sullivan just kept bawling back at him that he'd been with Brian since 8.15 that morning and he knew exactly what happened. Finally, Jimmy threw him over a table and bolted at the door. Jimmy pulled rank and got a lift out to Rockaway. He barged through his front door on 120th Street, nearly taking it off the hinges. But all was silent within. Maggie already knew. No one had told her. She just knew. She was up in their bedroom. The blinds were drawn against the clear blue September day. And in the shadowy hush, she was sitting on the side of the bed, staring at the wall. Her fists clenched, her slim body taut. She didn't say anything, not a word. Nor did he speak to her. The room was so quiet. It was like the birds would never sing again. The tears and the acres of emptiness They'd come later, but at that moment, Jimmy Murphy prayed to God. He'd never hear silence like that again. My name is Jimmy Murphy, in Rockaway I was born. Grew up on the boardwalk, never shared any store. And drinking in court, I was there with the best. Gave it my all, no point in giving anything less. At the age of 19, they sent me to Nam. Ended up in a hellhole, they called Tanang. About 20 miles south of them. One filthy day Killed a man with my bare hands I ain't never Been the same But still I Go on Still I 
survive Cause there ain't nothing better than being alive Still I go on, doing the best that I can You got no other choice when you are a rockaway man I married my Maggie as soon as I made it home She got me through the night, never left me alone We had a couple of kids, Brian and young Kevin Bought a house on 120 our own little piece of heaven I joined the NYPD and I worked my way up to a detective sergeant, ain't nothing wrong about that. But I couldn't get over the scene in my head of that Viet Cong kid lying there, bleeding, battered, and dead. But still I go on, still I survive, cause there ain't nothing better. Than being alive Still I go on Doing the best that I can You got no other choice When you are a Rockaway man Brian was the apple of his mother's eye From Regis to Georgetown, he reached for the sky A rising star, a lieutenant at 30 Kev lived in his shadow, never felt quite worthy Until one surreal September morning our world came crashing down without a warning Brian died a hero, Maggie lost her head Kept still in a daze and I might as well be dead Till the word leaked out, Brian was down the trades Thirty minutes before, they got hit by them planes the hell was he doing there? What was his game? Suit said, let it be Jimmy Just drive you insane Yeah, right Now I walk alone To these streets of New York I chucked in the cops I got my own line of work I find the truth about Brian Even if it kills me Hope to God it don't destroy the remains of my family yeah. Still I go on Still I survive Cause there ain't nothing better than being alive Still I go on I'm the best that I can you got no other choice when you are a rockaway. You're a rockaway man. You're a rockaway man. Youssef Ibrahim loved his Mercedes. Its black as night hue, sleekness of design, its style and comfort. He'd worked hard for his success and was pleased when the picture of him standing beside his car circulated with his family and friends back in Alexandria. Youssef had provided well for his family and they enjoyed the comfort of the red brick home on Shore Road in Bay Ridge. He had taken the subway to work for many years, 
after his arrival in New York from Egypt back in 1977, and did not even own a car until he opened his Fort Falafel Parlor in 1999. It was then he purchased the Mercedes, and it had given him much pleasure as he drove to and from the parlors with the voice of his beloved Chanteuse, Um Kaltum, seeping from the speakers. Youssef pulled out from his garage and drove some blocks along Shore Road to a clearing where he could view the narrows and the ships passing. How lucky to live near flowing water. It hardly compared to the mighty Nile, yet there was a serenity to this part of Brooklyn that one could no longer find in Alexandria. It soothed his soul, and he had need of healing, especially after the phone call from his friend Muhammad Rashid, Imam of his mosque. Usually such calls were casual and pleasant affairs. After an uncomfortable silence, however, Muhammad inquired about Fatima. Yes, Yusuf replied. His daughter was in good health, now 24, and studying for a law degree at Columbia University. And Muhammad was correct. There was indeed great hope of a match with the son of a cousin back home. It was then Muhammad took Yosef into his confidence. He had come across some notes that mentioned Fatima and her association with a police lieutenant, Brian Murphy, in the year before 9-11. Could Yosef shed some light on the matter? The recent deportation of two young Islamic students had led to rumors of informers. While Fatima's name had not arisen with the occupation of Iraq, tempers were fraying again in the mosque, and who knew where such matters could lead? Yusuf sighed. It had been almost three years since Fatima had disobeyed him. She had been young and impressionable. The girl had suffered much, and he had hoped the matter was well and truly behind them. He needed more time to think, but business called. He turned the key in the ignition and activated the CD player, Um Kaltum, began Al Atlal, Yusef's favorite song. Perhaps this was a good omen. But as the familiar anthem of love and loss, desire and regret washed over him, the events of that awful September once again flooded his mind. Would God ever grant him peace? He sighed as he pulled a Mercedes out onto Shore Road and drove to his falafel parlor on Atlantic Avenue, determined to do all he could to protect his daughter. Dawn. Hunger like a flame inside her It's the feast of Ramadan Her father's been praying for hours He wears his disapproval The silence, cold and hysterical Saw her last night with that Christian boy this world falls apart in America Mother fusses a 
about Brother laughs in the kitchen Phone explodes on the wall Oh my God, don't let it be my call Our father's glare is like violence Who else would break the tradition? Someone who laughs at our holy ways Tears us apart in America Fatima, you're breaking his heart He doesn't understand your dilemma A girl becomes a woman alone Those who love her can no longer help her why didn't they tell him back home? Things fall apart in America. Fatima picks up the phone. Michael is as usual hilarious Listens in silence and wonders Why American boys are oblivious I love you, but this is goodbye There are too many rivers between us Father, forgive me, you're right Things fall apart in America Fatima, you're breaking his heart He doesn't understand your dilemma A girl becomes a woman alone Those who love her can no longer help her And Michael stares at the phone As things fall apart in America How little I know about Jimmy anymore, what he does, what he's thinking. He's been a closed book for so long, I barely know how to open it. By the same token, I've no idea what he thinks of me, his loving wife. He probably imagines my troubles began when Brian died, instead of when it first dawned on me that I'd never be more than an English teacher in Rockaway. Never write books like Edith Wharton or Edna O'Brien. But back then, I had two lovely children and a devoted husband. Then, the world struck like a hammer and took our Brian away. I wasn't there for Kevin though I could almost hear him crying out for me as I'd pass him in the hallway. But my world collapsed, along with the North Tower. And now, I can even feel Jimmy slipping away. Does he really think he's pulling the wool over my eyes with the young Irish woman in Dolan's? Brian never confided in me about his dalliances either. He didn't have to. I always knew. In his last weeks, I could feel Brian needed to talk. But just when he'd be about to confide in me, his phone would ring or someone would interrupt. So I wasn't surprised to find his car waiting outside on my first day back at school after summer vacation. As usual, 
He acted as if everything was under control. But I could tell. He was in turmoil. He finally admitted there was a problem. At first, I didn't take him seriously when he told me he was being followed and was fearful about it. But he wouldn't elaborate. I called him a number of times in the last days, but he insisted he'd been exaggerating and that I should forget all about it. Then came the attack and the madness that followed. Whenever I tried to concentrate on what Brian had said, my head would start splitting. I should have told Jimmy back then, but even now, I can't bring myself to mention it. He's so obsessed with his own imaginings. After his conversation with Youssef, Jimmy couldn't bear to get on the subway, much less head back to Rockaway. Nothing made sense. Brian might have had a roving eye, but he wasn't crazy. And yet, Youssef was no screwball. He wouldn't want to disturb Jimmy or his family with some outlandish accusation, unless he too was hiding something. Jimmy turned on his heel and strode along Montague Street, past the dark certainty of St. Anne's Church. When he reached the promenade on Brooklyn Heights, he stared out across the East River at Manhattan. Though the view was postcard perfect, he couldn't get past the glaring emptiness where the Twin Towers had stood. Eventually, he tore himself away and decided he'd clear his head with a walk across the Brooklyn Bridge to Manhattan. It was cooler up on the wooden planks as the sun broke through the clouds and began to descend on the cranes and docks of New Jersey. Already the rush hour, cars and trucks were jammed both ways on the bridge, and a train rumbled underneath on its way to Manhattan. As he neared the middle of the bridge, he could pick out the ferry plowing its way across the swell from Staten Island, and in the distance the spires and domes of Ellis Island glowed in the fading sunlight. The setting sun was indeed working wonders, casting Manhattan skyscrapers into coppery, hoppery shades and setting a myriad of windows afire. He'd never heard of Edward Hopper until Brian gave him a poster of Nighthawks with its moody, nocturnal diner. After that, he couldn't get enough of the guy, for to Jimmy's eye, Hopper captured the unease of the city's silent soul. Ever since boyhood, Brian had his own agenda, but he always left clues, dropped hints and enigmatic smiles so that you could piece things together. Jimmy could tell he was missing something. But no matter how much he racked his brains, he couldn't identify it. A wave of weariness broke over him. Maybe he was washed up. He wondered if he should call it a day. Surrender to the poison of that big scar in the ground over on West Street and let all memories and suspicions remain back there. But he knew he couldn't. He had to persevere, and so he strode on as the watery sun lit up the sails and riggings of the lonely remains of Walt Whitman's schooners. And with each step, he became more in tune with the madness of Manhattan and the freedom that it almost promised those who rejoiced in being different. Manhattan had always been open to those who had tiptoed across some imagined moral fault line. 
those people like Brian who strayed from the accepted path from pursuing a goal but Brian wasn't around anymore to lift the veil from suspicious eyes he wasn't available to vindicate himself if the word got out about Yosef's accusation many would change their opinion of him. The hell would it? Jimmy swore he would get to the bottom of what his son had been up to. With that vow taken, his mind cleared, and he hurried on to the end of the bridge and into the depths of lower Manhattan. Swept away the dusty seaside bars, the scowling in the wake of the soul feel the scars. Don't bother listening to the sirens and guitars, cause those keys cheering in your purse belong to someone else's stolen. Car and the dust thickens the wind till the stars they are exploding and there's no one left to play just me and you lost in our rockaway blue What the hell are you doing here? The show was over The roadies said remove the gear Stage show light is broken There's no one to protect you now From sorrow and from aging The kind of man has shown his hand The husband waves her rage yeah. And the Center cannot hold because the stars they are exploding and there's no one left to play, just me and you lost in our rockaway blue. Something babe, but something beat him to it. Now we'll never know for sure if he knew what he was doing. All the ancient armies are knee deep in description. Each of them will pay the price for a disputed election. They are exploding and there's no one left to blame Just me and you, lost in our rockaway blue What was he doing, leaving us without a plan Still trying to make sense of it all Nothing left but to carry They are exploding and there's no one left to blame Just me and you lost out here in Rockaway Where the center cannot hold Because the stars, they are exploding And there's no one left to blame Just me and you lost in our Rockaway Rock away blue Lost in our Rock
Quick Blue.